the beginner stage is wild. Those those first couple years, people are crashing a lot, and it hurts. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. Our guest this episode is bobsled slash bobsleigh pilot Christopher Spring. He's a four-time Olympian, so we talk about a lot, everything from how you get into bobsledding, how you steer the sleigh, movies, crashes, and what it's like going nearly 100 miles per hour on ice. There's timestamps in the description for everything that we talk about because we do cover a lot of ground. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. We really appreciate it. How does this compare in real life to what I see on TV? Is it anything like that, or is the track just wildly different and faster? I don't think TV gives it any justice, to be honest. And they're, they're really trying these days with uh, like G-force monitors and accelerometers inside of the sled to give the audience like some sort of feedback so that they're like, oh, well, like that's how fast they're going, or that's how much G-force they're producing. But, you know, when you watch sleds go down the track, especially at like most people just watch our sport at the Olympic Games, they'll see the sled look exactly, you know, one sled to the next. It all looks pretty similar. But the truth is when you're when you're learning or when you go to a, a new track and you don't know how to drive it, it's crazy, man. People are, you know, people are crashing and the runs are just not that smooth and it takes years and years and years of, of experience to like get to that point where it's just like where, where the public look at it and they're like, well, I could do that. It definitely like, right to me, looking at it from the outside, I'm like, all right. So it's four dudes. They start running, they jump in the sled and then they just go down the track. The sleds are very difficult to drive. And that's just the easiest way to put it there they're finicky they they have like a personality you have to and 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 you're not so much driving the sled like you would drive a car you're just trying to guide the sled down the track but if you misguide it you'll end up on your head and it can hurt (laughs) um and so i think that i think that most people you know they see they see the sled you know not making many errors a couple taps here maybe a skid there uh but for the most part it looks quite easy, but but what we're actually doing in there is just these finite m- movements the whole way down the track to obtain that perfect line. How do you even get to your level in the sense that it seems like something that like you don't do it unless you're really good at it? Like it doesn't seem like something that would be very conducive to like, all right, it's my first time, and then you crash and you crash and you crash. Like how it doesn't seem like there's a beginner stage. The beginner stage is wild, and <laughs> excuse me, it's it's one of the few sports that actually gets safer the better you get. Because I look at sports like, you know, like your traditional sports, especially here in Canada, like hockey or football, and when you start off playing those sports, you know, you got lots of pads on. You, it's very slow. The game is is slowed down a lot for you. Um, you start at a very young age. There's lots of coaches and refs on the on the field or on the ice or whatever helping you pass and all this kind of stuff right and the the um the better you get at it the more your skills develop and in my eyes the the safer the sport gets in in bobsleigh there's no way to slow the sled down that much and so when you're when you're starting to learn how to drive you you we give you some theory or um, you know, when I first learned, you know, I, I walked down the track with a coach. I try and memorize which way the, the curves go. That way I don't get lost down the track. And then I'm trying to memorize what steers I need to do in each corner. Because the way I drive now is very based off feeling, feeling of pressure in my body, the feeling of what the sled is doing. But when you're first learning, you don't have that feeling in your body. So you're just steering based on a on a program that someone gives you come in at about this point in the track you steer the slide here you release that steer you come around you steer here and away you go and so it's it's very rudimentary or, or very mechanical way of learning how to drive but it really is the only way to learn until you get that feeling and when you first start you're just you're just uh hoping that what you're learning 
you're actually applying that to the track. And most times those, those first couple years, people are crashing a lot and it hurts and, and it's hard to find people to jump in the back because they're like, ah, screw that. I don't want to get in with you, man. Like I saw what happened last time. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult sport to develop in until you get to a point where you're pretty good. And then people actually want to, to, to race with you and, and be competitive with you. That's that learning curve. It, it's very difficult. And we see a lot of athletes come into the sport, but it's really difficult for athletes to stay in the sport. That makes a lot of sense, right? It's not like you can, there's no bunny slopes or practice runs. It's like, right. you just got to go. We can start uh, a little further down the track. Each, each bobsled track around the world has these kind of junior starts that you can start at where you can put the sled in at like, let's say, instead of, instead of starting at, at the very first corner, you start down at corner four or corner six or something like that. Um, and then you can, you, you know, the sled goes a little bit slower and you don't get the full track, but then you graduate up the track to the top and, you know, away you go. But it's, uh, it's still a very difficult sport to learn because it's so hard to, you know, I talk to people, I've done a little coaching in my, in my career and I, you know, tell people about like when you feel the pressure in your hand and they're like, they look at me like I'm speaking a different language. Like, what do you mean feel this pressure in my hand? I can't feel anything. So when we talk about like driving a bobsled, I don't actually know what that means. Like I have no idea what you're doing. For all I know, like you're putting your hands on the ice and just like pushing it. Like, I don't know what that actually means driving. Like, what do you, how do you drive it? I have no idea. Yeah, so inside the sled, like at the very front, that's where I sit. In a way, I can see what's going on. I have, uh, they used to have a steering wheel, actually, back in the day. Um, yeah, just this little tiny steering wheel, just like in a car. Maybe people were driving down the sleds like this, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they found that, 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 you know, if you turn left with a steering wheel and then you needed to turn right, this takes a lot of time to, like, go from turning left to turning right and some of the steers we have to do are very are very quick uh and so they graduated from a steering wheel to two handles just like this and basically these handles are connected to the front axle of the sled and if you pull right the front runner blades will turn to the right and if you pull left they they turn to the left and and then we can be a lot quicker on our steers to go from right to left because they're independent of each other and we don't have to turn a wheel this way or that way, right? And there's also some um, some bungees in there that will help return the sled back, uh, return the steering back to neutral, we call it, or, 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 or the starting point. That way we always are returning it back to going straight down the track. But we're not really like, cranking steers so much like you would in a in a car if, if you think like we're going quite fast right so if you're if you're driving down the, the highway at 120 kilometers an hour 100 or on some tracks 150 kilometers an hour which is over 90 miles an hour if you're driving down the highway at those speeds you're not going to be you know making some severe turns right so it's all very kind of uh soft and smooth turns that we're making and the the secret is more about timing not so much on how much you're steering but on the like the point in which you're steering in the track and so timing is very important more so than the amount that you're steering are you anticipating the turns kind of like okay need to go a little bit this way a little bit that way like I have a perfect run in every every bobsled track in the world. I have a perfect run laid out in my mind. I don't know if anyone has ever done the perfect, perfect run ever in a bobsled. They might think that they have, but there's always something where you could have been like, hi, ah, you know, if I was like two more inches this way in this corner or a little bit higher in this corner. And so what we're actually trying to do down the track is is execute this perfect run. But the reality is we're, we're just making corrections all the way down the track. So 
I'll come out of, let's say I'm here in Whistler right now and uh, it's the fastest track in the world. And if I come out of corner one, ideally I want to be on the middle right-hand side going into corner two. But maybe I'm like, you know, a few inches to the left. And the speed that corner two is coming at you, you can't just change that in between the in between the two corners. So that's what I'm that's what I've given myself. And so I'm just going to make a, a slight correction in the entrance of two, because there is going to be a little bit more pressure because my I, my entry into the corner isn't as ideal. And hopefully I get it back on track. Uh, but if I don't, it's no big deal because I'm only just a little bit off. And so when I exit two, maybe. You know, I ideally would like to be early into three with the sled angle pointed up into the curve, but maybe I'm a bit more parallel. So then I have to just fix it a little bit. And, and that's all we're doing the whole way down the track is we're looking ahead at what we've given ourselves from the last corner and what we have to achieve in the next corner and trying to adjust as we go. And basically it's well, what you're hoping for is that you don't have to adjust too much because every time you're steering, you're, you're creating friction in the sled and slowing down the acceleration. And so the less we steer, the faster we'll go. Just for kind of my understanding, right? Like if you didn't steer it at all, is this thing just like bouncing off the sides the whole way down? Yeah, it's, sli it's sliding off of corners. It's hitting the roof. It's, it's banging the... If you're skidding, you're banging walls, you're going to end up on your head somewhere down the track. It just seems like it would really hurt. Yeah, it's not, it's not fun. It's loud, too, when it, when you crash. It's loud, and it, and it, <laughs> and it hurts. <laughs> what do you do when you crash? You're just like, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah, you hide. Hope the guy in front of you or behind you is taller, I guess. Yeah, basically. Um, in format, it, it's very difficult to hide because there's – like if you ever get the chance to look inside a bobsled, there's not a whole lot of room. And there's some cool pictures that you can see on the internet from, you know, Olympics or world championship races of, of what a four man sled looks like with the athletes in it from above. And it's like, we're crammed in there. It's just like, it's small and there's no room. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm driving down the track, I've got my teammate behind me and he's kind of squished up, up, you know, behind me here and, and then i've got the cowling in front of me and so if we crash i'm just like you know the best i can do is go from from here to to here <laughs> and it's not very much you know my head's gonna get my head's gonna get hit a couple times and my shoulder's gonna get get burnt maybe a little bit um because there's quite a lot of friction on the on the ice and people get can get severe burns to their skin it's to the point where i've I know people that have had to get skin grafts from other parts of their body because that yes, because that burnt the skin off of their of their shoulders. But then, if you crash, right? As the pilot, do the other three guys, or do they just like way to go, man? Because it's basically <laughs> what's how does that conversation in the bobsled go after? Because it's basically it's not like the guy in the back is the reason that you crashed. Like, how does that conversation go? Yeah, it's tough. It's it's like, hey, sorry, sorry, guys. That that was my mistake. You, you know what I mean? Like, um, and typically, you know, at the at the level that we're at, you know, at a, at a Olympic or or world level, you're there because you you trust in your pilot and you believe in in the team and that ability of the team to win medals. And you know, shit happens, right? And sometimes you crash. It's the better you get, the the less you're crashing. You know, in the last ten years, I think I've had five crashes, maybe. Um, and so it doesn't happen very often. The the better you get, and uh, you know, when it when it does happen, uh, you know, I buy the guys some beers later that week to say sorry. And um, but they're but they're also very trusting in me as well, and they're ready to get back in the sled and and, and encouraging me and being like, "Hey, man, it was you know." Don't worry about it. You, you're a great driver. You, you've you've driven this track well before. We won medals here. Let's let's get out there in the race and let's you know let's do our thing. And and most of the time, you know, crashes are just they kind of just sneak up on you. And 
So how did you get started, right? Like bobsled doesn't seem to be necessarily the kind of, unless you're kind of born into it, like a family tradition. Like it doesn't seem like the sport where you're like, you know what? Bobsledding. Oh, yeah, 100%. And, and you know what? Most people, I would say that, again, the 95% of people in the world aren't even thinking about bobsled at the time that they're 20 years old. They even They might not even know what a bobsled is. And yet they become Olympic and world champions, some of these people. It's uh, it's pretty cool how the transitions happen. So for me, actually, so I was born in Australia. That's why I have like kind of a weird, well, I don't know. I think I have like a hybrid accent. And uh, I was living in Canada on a, a one-year work visa. And while I was in Calgary, which is in Alberta, they hosted the 1988 Winter Olympic Games. There's a bobsled track there. And, you know, I grew up in the 80s. I was born in the 80s, and I remember this movie, Cool Runnings. And I'm like, this is where, this is when the movie, like, this is it. This is where the movie was. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to go to this bobsled track and, like, go see some Cool Runnings memorabilia or something, <laughs> you know? Like, go, go just check it out. And so, you know, I, and I was athletic, too. It wasn't like I was a guy on the couch, just like, you know, what is this? So I went there and uh, I was running track at the time and um, just was talking to people like, hey, like, because there was a race on at the time. I didn't even know there was there was people racing, like at Canadian championships. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. Like, like, what does that person do? Or what is that thing on a sled? Or like, how does that work? And just asking questions with people. And this one guy was like, well, I just learned how to drive. Like, you want to jump in with me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm this Aussie guy traveling around. So, of course, I'm like, heck, yeah, let's go. When do I sign up? Uh, and it kind of just all fell fell into my lap from there. And, you know, it turns out that I, I didn't particularly like being in the back of a sled. I wanted to to learn how to drive the sled. And, and you, you take what's called a driving school uh where you learn like these fundamentals of how to drive a sled basically it's like you have no idea what's going on you're just sitting in this seat and you know trying to make it down the track and yeah kind of just it just went from there but i would say most people <clears throat> most people get into the sport through like a, a recruitment drive i know here in canada we we have like an online submission that you can do if you're interested in the sport you can submit like a, it's kind of like doing a combine online you send it in and if you have you put up some good numbers then we invite you out to do some testing and you know it kind of the, the ball rolls from there and it's very similar in the in the u.s as well um there's a few hubs that they have across the country and uh you can submit your your testing results online and then you know there, there are some amazing athletes out there that do this and it's like like where did you come from that everybody looks like a running back. Is there a reason that everybody kind of looks like that? Yeah, like we've got to get this sled moving fast. And they say there's three things to to being successful in in the sport of bobsled. You need to push fast, drive good, and have good equipment, like good sled. And you know the the first part of it is pushing fast because if you if when it, by the time everyone jumps in the sled if if you're already in last position, you can't, you can't, no matter how good your equipment is or how good of a driver you are, you just can't pick up those places down the track. You can pick up a few spots, but definitely not from last to first. And so you have to be pushing fast. The sled weighs, a four man sled weighs 210 kilograms. So, I don't know what that 500 is. pounds. Yeah, it's close like 500, to 500, right? Yeah. And uh, and so we want to get that sled moving as fast as possible. And most of the time, like a, a stereotypical bobsledder is around you know, six foot one, 225 to 30 pounds. And there's some exceptions. There are some guys that that are, you know, six, three, six, four, 240, 245. Uh, and there are some smaller guys that are, you know, five, 10, 200. And, uh, you know, cause we do have a, a weight 
limit that we that we have to stay under and so you kind of juggle that with with the different guys that you have um but yeah typically big strong powerful guys and girls like the girls are incredible uh the the way that the sport has evolved in both men's and women's bobsleigh um the athleticism in both in all the athletes it's, it's just every year another level gets you, you think that yeah. oh there's no way people can push faster than this and then you know it just keeps going up and up and up from my perspective right like i base everything like all right explosive power on like the 40 yard dash or the f vertical leap like what would what would most people be doing in those kind of tests mm. um from watching the nfl combine if you run like a four three or a four four these are like crazy numbers right yeah yeah i would say that that some of the best guys are running like like four five four six but they're also 225 230 pounds so so how different are are most tracks generally the same or are can tracks kind of vary pretty wildly yeah, there is a lot of variance, to be honest. Some tracks are, are similar, uh, but they all have their own personality as well. Um, when when a track is built, there is some uh, regulations or, or there's some rules that they have to build within. There has to, you know, it can't be too long or too short. It can't be too steep. Um, there has to be a certain amount of uh, turns and and certain types of turns as well, but for the most part, the, those those regulations are, are quite open, and you can make a you can make a track like totally totally different. So, uh, the track in Park City, Utah, is typically quite an easier track. Um, it's still it's still pretty fast. You'll do like 130 kilometers an hour um to get down the track it's it's usually quite easy um same with a, a track in austria in in uh this place called eagles in austria it's they're, they're those are typically like easier tracks and then you know you get to a track like lake placid in upstate new york and it's wild man. like that that track is like hold on you know you get to the bottom after a good run and you're beat up you know, the guys in the back are like, hmm, man, I know it was a good run, but I'm feeling it back here. You know, like it's, you, you got to hold on. And, and you can tell the the difficulty of a track by how much noise is in the the warm-up hut at the, at the top of the track where all the athletes just, that's where we are before we go and drive our sled down the track. Like all international athletes were in this one, it's like a locker room, but less fancy. And uh, we're all in there together. And if it's a difficult track, nobody's talking. It's very serious in there. There's a lot of concentration. Um, you know, people are like looking at each other and giving them a like, you know, like, hey, all the best kind of thing. But if it's an easy track, people are joking around and people are playing games and laughing and carrying on and you know, planning what they're doing this weekend and all this kind of stuff. So it's hilarious to see the the difference, you know, just in the in the start house or in that warm up hut of how difficult a track is by the level of volume of noises up there. What's the hardest track? Uh, I would. It depends who you ask, uh, because you know practice makes perfect. So a lot of people think that the track right here in Whistler is the hardest track. For me, I don't personally think so because you know we train here all the time so i'm i'm quite used to it in saying that i still respect the track and there there's still some of that quietness that goes on it, even for me before i go down the track but typically there's three tracks that everyone talks about in the world that are the hardest tracks it's here in whistler bc lake placid in new york and oldenburg in Germany, which is in uh, Saxony, it's like the the state over there in Germany. It's in East Germany, right next to the uh, Czech border. Those are the three most difficult tracks in the world, in my eyes, and and I would say in ninety nine percent of people's eyes.
too. And even the Brakeman know they're like, oh man, we're going to Altenburg next week. So what are the other people in the – are they just basically they push and then they're just hanging out? Or are you kind of telling them like, hey, guys, lean left, lean right? Or are they just like, I pushed, now I just hold on for the rest of the – Yeah, you got it. They push and they get in and that's it. Now, I don't want to dumb it down too much like that because <laughs> their job is extremely important. Um, pushing that sled, like I was saying, if you don't, if you don't push fast – then you have no chance of being successful in the race. So we have to push fast. So their job already is like, I'm so very grateful when we, when we have a fast push, because then it, it gives us as a team way more su- chance of success. And then getting into the sled, there's not a lot of room in there, right? So getting four big guys to get inside this sled, this tiny little sled and, and sit in a good aerodynamic shape is a lot harder than than you would than you would think and practice does make perfect but geez you gotta practice a lot to get in to to do that so to not only push the sled fast but to then load with speed so that you're not slowing the sled down as you're getting into the sled and then to sit in a position that creates you know, this really nice aerodynamic position in the sled where everything is like, it's trailing down. So it's, it's, uh, you know, you're not getting any of this dirty air at the back and no one's heads higher than the person in front of them's head and things like that. Shoulders on up. And it's, it's a science, man. And like the, the teams that do it really well are usually the teams that are very successful as well. So how do they decide like who gets in, second third fourth is it just based on height um no not always based on height it's usually based on your physical attributes as an athlete so if you're you know the person that gets in last has to be running the longest so typically they're the fastest athlete as well because they're the one that they're the one that is continuing to run while everyone's getting in they're still running and and if they're not that fast then they're going to be slowing the sled down right so typically the the bigger stronger athletes that aren't as fast are helping get the sled moving and like breaking that inertia so to speak and then getting in and the faster athletes are the ones that are getting in last how okay how far is it from like once you start to once you get into the sled uh, it's roughly around 50 meters, give or take. Oh, that's farther than I thought it was. <clears throat> yeah, it depends on how steep the track is, right? So some some tracks are very flat, and so you push for longer because you don't ever reach that speed where you're like, well, I can't keep up anymore. And some tracks are really steep where it's like you got to push and just get in. And so uh, I don't know how far I run, but... I have this like built-in pedometer in my brain that just a number pops up when I get in the sled and I know how many steps I took. And uh, in a in a track that's really steep in format, I'm taking 12 or 14 steps. And in a track that's very flat, I'll take 20 steps. Uh, and so, you know, if you think... I think when um, when most sprinters run 100 meters, they're running like 45 steps. Yeah. And so, you know, if I'm taking 20 steps, I'm probably running 40 meters, somewhere around that. Is that how, like, everybody in the sled does it, right? Like, just throwing out numbers. The first guy takes 12. The second guy takes 16. The other guy takes, tw- right? It's like, is everybody counting, like, I take this many steps, then I get in? No one's usually counting. It's, it, it, it's based off of when the pilot gets in basically. So if I get in, then the guy that's sitting number two behind me usually takes, like he'll see me get in and then he'll react to that. Okay. Now on my next cycle, I'm going to get in. And then the number three guy will be like, Oh, I saw the number two guy get in. So on my next cycle, I'm going to get in. And then it usually is two or four steps later. So if I take 12, it's like 14 or 16 steps for the guy behind me. And then, 
16 or 18 for the next guy and so on and so forth. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Yeah, let's do it. Let's start with the easy one. How do you feel about Cool Runnings? Is Cool Runnings the only bobsled movie that exists? Well, there's more bobsled movies. I was actually in a documentary. It's kind of like a bobsled lifestyle documentary. Um, and so it's not the only bobsled movie, but for the most part, and I kind of even cringed when I said, like, oh, I was, you know, I, that's how I got into sport is because I watched Cool Runnings. It's because it, at, at times it, it, it can devalue our sport. Uh, because the athletes that are in the sport are, they're so freaky. And it's crazy how how athletic they are. And then, you know, when we get a reference towards Cool Runnings, which is a great film, and it's really brought a lot of attention to the sport, and it continues to do so over the years, sometimes it can just devalue the the level of competition that we have in the sport. It's a love-hate relationship. I get it. Yeah. It um, yeah. Your favorite track, your least favorite track. Not that it's a bad track, just that like ah, I just don't. That's that's not my cup of tea. Favorite track, and I think everyone will say this. It's in Switzerland in a town called Saint Moritz, and it's because that's the birthplace of our sport. That's where our sport began. That's where they first started bobsledding. So there's a lot of history there, and it's what's called a natural track. So they actually build the track out of snow and ice every single year, like a huge ice sculpture. And it has personality behind the track. It's so smooth to slide on it. It's quiet. And like I said, there's just so much tradition there. And it's the only natural track left in the world. And so every time we go and slide there, it's, it's magic. I'd probably say Eagles in Austria because it, it's such an easy track. And if you don't push fast, you have no chance of winning. And so it kind of takes my skill out of it, my driving skill out of it. So, But the town is beautiful, so there's a plus. Favorite piece of bobsled or lingo? Ooh, there's lots of, <clears throat> there's lots of lingo um, in, the, in the bobsled world. And we have a lot. We have, like, our own language here in Canada that we, we use a lot. Um, and... I would say that we use this word rinse. <laughs> we used to use it all the time. And uh, you could just interchange it with whatever you want. Like, man, I rinsed that run. As in, that was a good run. Or I just got rinsed on that run. As in, I had a bad <laughs> run. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's all uh, in the context, right? It's all in the context. Yeah, exactly. I don't even know how this word even came about or got evolved or you know i could be sitting at dinner i'd be like yo can you rinse me one of those brownies and... <laughs> <laughs> this is just it applies for everything it's context yeah. right yeah exactly is there, is there trash talk in bobsled are you ever like uh, the, hey, yeah Swiss, there is but it, you guys suck. it's all fun and games too though like there is trash talk but it's it's all within good fun. Like we're we're a very small sport, and so we travel a lot together with all the nations. We stay in the same hotels a lot of the time, and you know at the end of the season we're all we're all partying together too, right? And so um, there is some trash talk, but it's it's all in good in good faith and good humor. Like what would you say to like what would be an example of bobsled trash talk? Um, like. Well, yesterday I was on the track um, helping coach a little bit, and the number one driver in the world from Germany uh, was walking by, and he says, hey, Chris, you don't start in the World Cup race? And I said, no, nah, I'm like still rehabbing some injury. And he's like, huh, you're like a vacation slider. Oh, uh, I don't know if it's trash talk or not, but yeah, it's but just still, little things like that. Little yeah. things. Worst crash. Ooh. Yeah, I had a really bad crash in uh, 10 years ago, in 2012, in on this difficult track in East Germany, in Altenburg, where I went through the roof of the track, like I crashed my sled, and we're upside down, and we hit the roof, which is, you know, the roof's there just to keep sleds inside the track, and 
yeah, we hit it and we actually like pierced through the roof at 120 kilometers an hour. And uh, we kind of got stuck in the, the metal structure of the roof. And it like, it basically like can open the sled. And there was a, there's a lot of wood up in there and a, a two by four impaled me. Um, and I'm saying this with like a, like a smile on my face jokingly. And I look at your face and you're like, what the like heck? Um, it definitely was worse than what I'm portraying it to be, but I feel like that's the only way I can talk about it without, you know, getting into the moment too much. And yeah, it was a really yeah. bad crack. Um, and, uh, I was out for, for many months and, uh, so were my teammates and, um, typically that never happens. That, that was kind of like one of those freak accidents that happened, but, um, yeah, I was, I was impaled. I broke my nose and, and was impaled by a piece of wood um, through my butt and into my back and made a full recovery, though. And um, uh, three of us out of the four in that sled two years later competed at the Olympic Games. So pretty pumped about that. Damn. Yeah, Dude, man, what was, was that first <laughs> run like then after like after that? Were you like, holy shit, am I going to do this again? I'm sure 10 years yeah, ago, like, I, you're I sick about talking about it, but. Uh, no, not particularly, but, but my first round back, I, I did it at a very easy track um, with my coach uh, who jumped in the back. And um, it was just the two of us there on Valentine's Day, actually. And, uh, yeah, we ripped down the track and I was like, oh, it's just like riding a bike. No problems. But definitely for, for years after, I I struggled a lot with, with some anxiety around it and some PTSD and stuff like that and it was just things i had to overcome with my coaches and support stuff and and even going back to that track every time i go back there to race there's there's always some of those feelings there and it's always brought up too you know and um i do my best to you know put those feelings aside until after i'm done but uh you know inevitably they're going to creep in but we've had some great results on that track since then and and every time i go there i'm really excited to race there um because generally we do pretty well there now the um uh so like what country would you say that bobsled is the biggest in germany hands down and anybody even close um in terms of like tradition maybe switzerland um but that 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 would be yeah other than that, no, no one's close. There's the top country in the world for the last, I don't know, decades and decades and decades. has always been Germany. They're they're winning a lot of medals. There's a, there's a rich history within the, within the sliding sports, luge, skeleton, and, and bobsleigh. Um, it's very well funded. Um, the crowds there are amazing, and there's huge supporters and fans, and it's it's cool vibe to race there because people are into it. Not to bring it up again. But like, who's got the best chant? Because I know of the chant from Cool Runnings. Like, does everybody have a chant, or do you guys? Just oh go yeah. Now? No, people have a chant. You know, like, uh, you know, from, you know, it's, sometimes there's like some, some some slaps like this, some fist pumps. You know, like people put their hands in, and it's like one, two, three, whoop, or whatever it is. Um, the chant that I that I uh, had for the last few years is. We'd put our hands together, and I'd say, I'd say kind of, kind of quiet. I'd say, "What time?" And then the guys would say, "Game time." And then I'd say, "What time? Game time." And that's what that's what we would do. Um, but uh, I would say the best chant. Ooh, actually, I saw this Austrian skeleton girl um, racing last week here in Whistler, and it's just her and her coach, and uh, she like like punches him like boom and then slaps his hand like this and it's this little girl she's probably like five foot five 120 pounds or something and he's just standing there like this big guy he's a olympic silver medalist and uh you know he's and she's like she's kind of shaking on the line she's like ready to go he's and then uh, and then the light goes green and boom slaps puts the sled down and goes and i'm like whoa this girl is fired Oh, who has the hardest time getting in the sled? 
Like, is there a position uh, where, like, oh, that that's the hardest one? I would say it's the pilot. You know, we have the smallest amount of room to get in there. And I, I think I'm pretty good at getting in the sled. Like, I pride myself on how fast I can get in the sled. But some of my teammates, you know, like, there's been a couple times where I've, like, trip getting in or like you know had some trouble getting in and they're like wow it was like watching santa claus trying to get down that chimney man you're like really struggling to get in there to squeeze your fat body into this into this sled you know and um but typically if you if you watch like like bobsled fails at, at the start push start it's the guys on the side they have the hardest time getting in and it like it looks easy when it's done right, but it's not. Like it's really difficult to to do it properly and to do it really well. I'll end on this one. It's kind of funny. So when you go out to eat or you go hang out with the other guys on the team, how close do you guys sit together at restaurants? Like, are you so used to just being bunched up that you're all like, why are those four guys on one side of the booth? Like, oh, that's the bobsled team. Oh man, you know, I wanna I wanna keep the this fairy tale going, and I'll say yeah, we sit right next to each other. You know, we even strip down to make sure we're in our lycra. You know, in that spandex, we just sit there next to each other because we love it. We love getting in there, squeezing ourselves in. It's not unusual. Like when we're in the car, you know, and if there's uh the back seat's open and there's only two guys sitting back there no we sit together we don't sit on either side we're gonna sit together all four in the front right <laughs> that's it yeah we got that bench seat we just sit in there just tight like this here comes the bobsled team we get three teams that's they it. only need one car <laughs> right. um man you go are you going 2024 or too early to tell? um 2026 we just had a games um, this year. Did they? So we got. They move it twenty twenty six. Yeah, the summer games in Paris twenty four. Oh, that's then, right. That's yeah. right. We'll see, that's man. Right. Um, yeah, I, I just had knee surgery in the in, earlier this year, um, just to clean up a, a dodgy knee I've had for many years, and so just rehabbing with that, trying to come back and you know make a decision next year when I'm healthy, and I would like to. I am. My nickname is Old Man Spring, though, because I'm the old guy. So, you know, people are probably like, man, when is this guy going to retire? He's so old. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I love it, and, and we're still successful. So, like, why not keep going if I can? Just if my body can hold up. That's the biggest, the biggest challenge. That's all the questions I got, man. Is there anything else we missed or kind of what's coming up next for you? Um, well, the World Cup is next week here in Whistler, and unfortunately, it's the first time I won't race a World Cup at home here in like over ten years. And you know, it'll be sad not to race, but also like needed as well. Like I can't just keep beating yeah. my body up, you know. Like I got to give it a rest sometimes too, right? So, um, yeah. And then I, I took a, a coaching job here this winter um, while I rehab, and I'm gonna be taking care of these like younger kids trying to teach them how to drive a bobsled um, and hopefully get them to the youth Olympic games next year. So that's kind of a, like a cool new challenge for me. Um, whilst also trying to fit in like my next career after sports, I'm a, I have my commercial pilot's license. So I'm flying a bunch and trying to, trying to get hours flying and, you know, see where that takes me as well. Are you an all in person? Or do you more dip your toes in a little bit? Like, do you just go for it right away? Or are you more cautious? Definitely a uh, heads first, you know, kind of person. I would, I'm just distracted by the fact that you're wearing a beanie inside. I love, And I, I love don't know how beanie. to feel about this. I, I just recently discovered, as of a few days ago, uh, how much I kind of like beanies. How did you just now discover a beanie? Like, why didn't you try a beanie beforehand? Um, I don't know. I, I guess I always had a jacket that had kind of the hood on it, right? Like, I've just never really been a beanie person until 
my wife brought me home a beanie and then I I wore it all weekend and I just you know not now it's carrying on are you going to get multiple ones do you feel like you're going to have multiple beanies like multiple hats or do you think you're going to have this one beanie and that's probably where it's going to stop for you I've actually already ordered uh, other beanies so yes there will be multiple beanies for me this winter wait a minute you get one beanie how many did you order Three. What colors did you get? All the same brand? Did you get multiple brands? What'd you do? So I got a Detroit Red Wings one. Okay. Okay. Got a Mercedes Formula One beanie. Oh, God. Oh, God. Here we go. <sighs> the bandwagon fan. Not you even went close. in and you had to buy all. So now hockey is now apparently the new bandwagon sport. It's not. Let's just face it. You don't know the real John Scholl. No, I do. I think that you don't want to admit that you tend to have bandwagon fan tendencies. And you go from sport to sport that this is now the biggest sport in the world for you. And you're going to go all in like we had just talked about. See, I... And then you're going to go to the next thing five minutes later. Right? You may go all in, but you're not dedicated. I have an addictive personality. See, I am not. I'm a dip my toes in the water kind of person. Let's jump in head first. Let's uh, let's just see what happens. I mean, I, that that was then. Obviously, now as I'm an older man with responsibility and a family, I don't think I would necessarily do that. Yeah, but I, I um, think that's the same way for everybody. I mean, I, I feel like age makes us wise, but also takes away some of our. Uh, I, I don't know what you are, our, our sense of wanting an, advent, an adventure. I think that you have a much better understanding of the consequences of what can go wrong. I mean, you have more to lose and you understand better what can happen. I think that's why you get a little bit more tentative. I mean, I had to give up alcohol and bad food because my chest was trying to create an acidic hole in itself. So, How long do you think the beanie phase is going to last for you? I mean, are you saying I should wear one every episode for the foreseeable winter future? I think you should go for it. It can't also be that possibly be that cold in your house where you feel like you need to be wearing a beanie. I listen. I I have subscribed to the Nick Vincent, uh heat slash air regiment. It is fifty four degrees in my house right now. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. That's that a kid. It's, it's, it's actually it's it's not fifty four. It is sixty one though. Sixty one still pretty cold. Sixty one's pretty good. That that might even be cold. Now I'll go sixty three seventy two. No way. Sixty three is where I'm going to put the thermostat in the winter. Everybody can toughen it up. If it's a sixty three degree day outside, you're out there with shorts and a t shirt. You're going to be okay in the house. And it's seventy eight in the winter in the summer. I'd go 82 if I could get away with it, but my family would complain too much. Yes, yeah, I, I can't do that hot in the summer. Like, I, I could, right? I think we both could. It's my wife and my kids that aren't going to let me get it up to 78 in the summer. Uh, in the winter, I, I think you've called me out before. I mean, it. I, I used to have it at 68, but I, I told the missus, listen, energy prices aren't going down, sweetheart. Right. You got to put your foot down. And if to. that means wearing a beanie in the house, then you got to wear a beanie in the house. Uh, yeah, listen, I, you know it's cold in my house. I, I'm a bigger guy. When I have a, a beanie on, uh, two pairs of pants, and a sweatshirt, something is wrong. Do you have on two pairs of pants right now? Man, I have on uh, like these long John things underneath my blue jeans. It's kind of nice because I don't wear underwear with these. They're like they're like under they're like spandex pants so like i can you know they're fantastic wait a minute are they long johns or do you have spandex like are you wearing like tights like somebody's wearing tights or are you wearing like long johns like you're out in a cabin in the 1800s <laughs> no I'm not they're not at no they're like they're like spandex uh they're, they're not under armor because i'm cheap but they're are they uh, women's you know, they're like tights the, no they're like the costco like heat wear or whatever do they look like women's tights on you like, if you went out in public, would somebody be like, why is that guy wearing women's tights? They would probably question, why Why am I wearing spandex pants? I don't think the tight 
leg clothing is a look that looks good on most men. It's not something a lot of men wear. How many shirts do you have on right now? Just one. One shirt and two pairs of pants? Yeah, my legs get cold, man. What? I I don't know how to explain it to you. I have never ran into somebody whose legs got cold before their upper body. Do you have no leg hair whatsoever? No. I have very little body hair. My body was not made to be in the wilderness. I can honestly say I could go outside, completely bundled up, upper half, and go outside with shorts shorts on and be fine. I don't know if I've ever had cold legs. Uh, shout out, Tom. What you drinking over there, little Diet Pepsi? Diet Coke? Diet Pepsi. That a kid. Diet Wild Cherry Pepsi, because I want all the chemicals. Give me all the fucking chemicals. I don't care if it does have carcinogens and, you know, whatever that, what's it called? Aspartame? Aspartame? Aspartame. We had a food chemist on here a number of episodes again. It actually gave, like, a really interesting, from a, looking at it from a chemical perspective in terms of what it actually does to your body. He's like, it does nothing. It's been studied almost more than any other food additive, and it's completely fine. It's just that other people can make money off of complaining about it. Oh, of course. It's it's why I continue to do this podcast. All right, uh, here we go. Let's give some shout-outs. Uh, Sasha Wemmy, uh, the Sashinator. I was thinking... Because remember how we were in, in, in high school when American Pie came out? No. Okay. Well, there's a character in that movie, and he calls himself Shermanator. And I thought, that's pretty good. Sashinator's pretty good. I I think you have to have an S name to get away with Nader. You know what I mean? Do you think that she wants to be called Sashinator? Would that uh, be like, if you were like, hey... You're dating, this is a woman, I assume, correct? It sounds like a... Yeah, yeah. Because Sasha can be a man's name. It can be. Sasha Baron Cohen, what? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think that if you were dating this person and you were like, hey, Sashinator, she'd be like, <laughs> no, let's not do that. She'd be like, ah, uh, actually. All right, uh, let's see here. Quick reminder uh, for the people what the nickname you gave your wife. No one wants to hear it. So why? Sorry, why what? do you make? Why what, do you make me wubby? go back through it? The wubby wubbers, wubby wubs, <laughs> wubby and hubby, <laughs> wubby wubbers. Yeah. Well, as you get older, you realize that uh, pet names and nicknames are just fucking terrible. So, okay. anyways, all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hunter Roosh, appreciate you, uh, Gabe McMillan. James Leggett, uh, Eli Munster. I had to put this person on here because it's one of my former favorite baseball players. This isn't him, but he has the same name. Uh, Victor Martinez, uh, Wayne White, Dan Villani, Gage Mack, and Angelo Barbudo. Appreciate all of you. I would like to go on record saying that the only baseball player that this podcast truly cares about is Bartolo Colon <laughs> and Rick Ankeel. But back when Rick Ankeel was a pitcher throwing like 95 miles an hour into the stands. Yeah, but Rick, he was, Rick Ankeel was never that good. He was just a, a personality. At least Bartolo Colon, for as terrible as he is, was a good pitcher. Was he a terrible person? No, but he wasn't. He wasn't. I don't know. He was. He was just a meh. You know what I mean? It's like no one will remember Bartolo Colon in twenty five years, but they'll remember Randy Johnson. They might remember Rank Rick Ankiel. They'll remember Derek Jeter. Will they remember Bartolo Colon? Probably not. No, but he'll always be one of those guys that like that's a professional athlete. If you haven't looked up pictures of Bartolo Colon. Do yourself a favor and Google Bartolo Colon and be like, that's a professional athlete? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 He is. Okay. Oh, what was your third beanie hat then? You said that you bandwagon fan the Detroit Red Wings, bandwagon the Mercedes whatever race that is. Is it NASCAR this week or is it uh, dirt bike racing? What is it? Uh, it's actually uh, swashbuckling. No. Uh, I, I went with uh, another one of my... Loves 
and I got a Hulk Hogan beanie. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be sweet. You're going to love it. Or What color not. is it? What color is the Hulk Hogan beanie? Is it red or white? Red it's and red white. and yellow. It's predominantly yellow with red in there. You don't see a lot of bright colored beanies. They're usually kind of neutral tones. Grays, browns, blacks. Yeah, greens. this one's going to be fantastic. I think you're really going to dig it. Does it say Hulkamania on it? Does it say Hulkamania on it? Because if it doesn't, it's not fantastic. Uh, it does not say Hulkamania on it, no. It just says Hulk Hogan. Uh, yeah. How much you spend? Last question. Uh, 1999, I think, for that one. I have no idea if that's a good beanie price or not. I, I have no idea either. If you would have said 39.99, I would have been upset. Did you go as high as 39.99 for any of your beanies? No, no, they were all under twenty dollars. This one really is more of a just. I want to get your take on this, not necessarily a question, but uh, when is it too cold outside uh, to not wear shorts? Like, what's the temperature? What's the cutoff point? Like thirty-five degrees? Is it freezing? Is it twenty degrees? I think once it passes under 45 degrees, then you need to stop wearing shorts. Not necessarily because you it's that cold, but just because society dictates that under 45 degrees, I think it's time to start wearing pants. Otherwise, you start to look like a little bit of a weirdo. I think okay. that once once it drops below 32, that's when like, oh man, it's getting cold. Like under freezing, you'll go outside and like, damn, it's cold. Oh, so that, that that brings up the reason why I asked. So you think somebody looks a little different if they do wear shorts in the middle of winter? Yeah. I mean, if unless you just came from the gym or are running, if you're just kind of out and about and it's between 32 and 45 degrees outside and somebody has shorts on, I'm going to be like, that person has shorts on. <laughs> and wonder why they have shorts on. All right. It now makes me wonder, why do you have shorts on? Yeah, like what? I, yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm one of those people. So uh, anyways, um, what is the more disgusting? This Christmas makes no thing? sense to me. So you're going to wear shorts outside when it's 40 degrees. But if it's 60 degrees in your house, you've got on two pairs of pants, a coat and a beanie. There's it's just a different feel, man. I don't know what to tell you. I get mentally I get mentally prepared to go outside. I'm ready for the winter. Just not inside where you spend all your time. Uh, anyways, uh, what is the more disgusting Christmas delicacy? We'll call them <laughs> fruitcake or eggnog. Eggnog is disgusting. They're both fucking terrible, though, right? I don't honestly know if I've ever had fruitcake. I don't even know. I don't even know if I've ever seen it, to be honest with you. Oh, let me, let me find you a good picture of a fruit cake here. I mean, I've seen a picture of a fruit cake, but I don't know if I've ever seen it in person. Oh, it's so terrible. So there were four, uh, obviously four uh, choices. Uh, this week, it was uh, Axl Rose apparently being sued because he tossed a microphone off of a concert stage in Australia. And it literally gave a woman two black eyes. So yeah, either she well, didn't I mean, catch it or he whipped that shit into the crowd. Um, apparently, there is a uh, wolf mind controlling parasite that is going around national parks in the United States that is uh, wreaking havoc on the wolf population, causing them well, to do it's controlling their minds. The wolves. Yeah, it's a bacteria, apparently, that gets into part of the nervous system and makes them go kind of crazy. Um, what is similar, do? similar yeah. to that, uh, like them being rabid, but they're not rabid all the way. Oh, so it's like uh, rabies, but not rabies. Yeah. Uh, okay. the GMA romance between the two anchors, uh, where they were cheating on their spouses, uh, go good morning America, I should say, uh, anchors that now they've been taken off air. So congratulations. Good for them. Uh, I do not care about that, but I do love some drama. Can't stop love. Uh, but Overwhelmingly, with 83% of the vote this week, uh, people want us to talk about Cocaine Bear. That, to me, is exactly what movies should be. Just <laughs> fun. Just make a fun movie. 
It but doesn't not- have to be good. It doesn't have to be true. I don't care who the actors are. Just make a fun movie. It's Sharknado, but with bears and cocaine. So here's the thing. Do you know anything about Cocaine Bear? I'm assuming it's a bear that got into a bunch of cocaine. But it's based upon a true story. Yeah, Is it? Like, what did the bear do? So apparently uh, this happened back in 1985 in Georgia. And uh, essentially what happened was there was a cocaine Georgia the country, smog- Georgia the state. The state. Of course this happened in America. Where else would uh, we give a shit if black bears ingested 40 wh- packets of cocaine? Well, you got to bring race into it. Right. <laughs> well, it's not about race. <laughs> uh, race. Anyway, so essentially what happened, according to the story, is uh, there was a, a plane, a drug smuggling plane that was flying over Georgia, obviously. The pilot was too heavy, so he threw a duffel bag of coke out of the plane to l- lighten the load. Well, two things happened. One was in, in doing that, he lost control of the plane. He tried to parachute the pilot. His parachute didn't open, and he ended up dying anyways. Damn. So the plane crashed with all, with all the cocaine. He's dead. Uh, essentially what happens was, so you have all this cocaine that falls into the forest. A 175-pound black bear gets a hold of one of the duffel bags, eats. <laughs> it's not funny. Eats 40, uh, yes, four zero, uh, large bags of cocaine. And obviously dies. Uh, The bear is found three months later next to uh, 40 open plastic containers of cocaine. And uh, authorities put two and two together. And uh, that's that that's how it happened. So but the bear uh, wasn't like rampaging. It just I mean, 175 pounds, like you think of a bear being a huge animal. But if like 175 pounds just plowing through like a packet of cocaine (laughs) yeah well you would think they could smell it or notice somehow that like oh i shouldn't do this i i don't know but the 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 pilot of the plane apparently is is a well-known figure andrew carter thornton who was a, a narcotics officer who turned to the dark side and became the leader of the company which was a drug smuggling ring in kentucky which while researching this uh, this story, uh, apparently there is uh, <laughs> the bear, nicknamed the cocaine bear, is currently on display in Kentucky at the Kentucky Fun Mall in Lexington, <laughs> Kentucky. <laughs> God, insult to injury for that bear. Yeah. Wait, so the bear um, didn't go on like a rampage or anything? It basically just died right away? No, I mean, according to the, the – I know in the movie – uh, and, and I and I haven't seen it. Crazy, yeah. yeah. The trailer has the bear going crazy, but but according to factual accounts, the bear was found three months after the accident happened with all this cocaine. And if you're wondering, I know people out there that are listening can't see this, but apparently, that's the bear on display. God, they put a hat on him like some asshole. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't. Apparently, it's like the uh, the state hat for Kentucky, but that's a pretty dick move, if you ask me. Yeah, take the hat off the bear. That's just insulting to the bear. Yeah. Um, I hope that this is the biggest movie of twenty twenty three. Well, what's kind of funny is so it's apparently the last acting credit for Ray Liotta. Uh, Ice Cube's son stars in it. O'Shea Jackson Jr. Carrie Russell who is a pretty well-known, uh, I believe she was in Felicity, might have been the main character of Felicity, or Felicity on Felicity, I really don't know. But what I found to be so mind-baffling about this whole thing is the director is Elizabeth Banks. Yeah, she's actually, I think, done some movies that were I, good. She's yeah, apparently I just, very funny. I guess I just didn't just realize... Aren't. That so when when someone had sent me this trailer, I had expected it to be like a Sharknado. Oh, it's not it, supposed to be funny. I mean, maybe, but when you read the real story, I kind of feel fucking terrible for the bear in real life. Yeah, I always feel bad for the animals. But I mean, this this thing was probably like, oh, <laughs> this shit's amazing, and the next thing you know, its heart gives out. I feel bad for the bear. Okay, are you are you ready? I, I am. What's our intro? Do you have an intro or am I supposed to do the intro? 
I don't know. We we can just go candle, 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 candle of the of the. Whoosh. It's time. <laughs> Saddle up and ride with the outlaw candle connoisseur. Whoosh. Candle of the month. All right, so I'm going. I'm going back to a familiar store here because I got to tell you, I love shopping local. I do, but Yankee Candle. I got to tell you. They may be my favorite candle distributor in the entire country. Aren't, there, aren't they the only candle distributor that sells only candles? No, I mean, probably mainstream, sure. But, I mean, there's a lot of other stores that have, yes, they're they're not candle-only stores. So you, you probably are correct on this. But Yankee but. Candle is the only candle-only own, store that would be a nationwide recognition. Not like... Barb's House of Candles or something like that, right? <laughs> so it makes sense that Navy Candle is the... Is it oh, Yankee sorry. Candle? Yankee Candle. Yeah. Sorry, Barb, but I'm probably not buying one of your candles. You can send them, though, if you want to the show. Uh, all right, anyways. So, obviously, it's Yankee Candle. This one, probably one of my favorites. Uh, Winter Night Stars. Winter Night Stars, huh? Okay, give us the, give us, give us the flavor profile. Here's the description. Gaze up. No, I don't want the description of it. I want your description of it. You well, think I mean, we had honest, this conversation last time. It's like you're relying on crutches. You're asking people no, I, I to was recommend give it things. You want to have multiple candles. Yeah. I want to hear your take. Not what the PR people in the marketing department came up with. What does John Shaw think of the con- candle of the month? So here's the thing. I, I wasn't expecting much of it, right? I smelled it in the store. It didn't smell good. But it's one of those candles that you gotta let it burn for a few hours, and then and then and then that's when it gets you. I don't mm, know. Slow burn candle, huh? Yeah. So it, I, I describe it like this, or I, I've described it like this um, to others who are curious about the candle. Um, you wake up; it's 15 degrees outside, and it's when you first open that door to go outside, and you get hit in the face with just that cold arctic air but it has a smell to it right it has a specific wintry smell so this candle at first is going to give you like a floral type of type of scent you're going to be like this doesn't smell like winter at all give it two or three hours let it get into the wax a little bit it's a one wicker one Mm. wick candle Um, okay okay let it burn a little bit like i said and then it'll start to take over and then you're going to be like oh oh that's where we're at. Now, is that common of a lot of candles? Do you have to really let it burn for a little while? How many candles do you have to like let it slow burn as opposed to like, oh, you notice that scent immediately? Well, I mean, there's there's several kinds. I mean, if you get ones that are layered, obviously, um, but usually one that's just usually candles that are just advertised as one scent or one kind of uh, f- uh, fragrance usually hits you with what it's going to be within the first five or ten minutes. Mm. This candle oh boy, does not. Our, that's a rare. Our sign our, fell off. That's okay. Oh, shit. That's a bad sign. Uh, anyways, check it out. Um, uh, Winter Night Stars, Yankee Candle. Uh, I believe it's on sale. Half off. I don't know about shipping, though. So, um, When you go about smelling a candle for the first time, do you have a ritual? Right, like I think of, we had a whiskey critic on here one time. He's like, I like to sit in this chair. First, I do this, then I let it breathe for a little bit. Then maybe I'll add a drop of water to kind of bring out the flavor and try it again. Like, what's your smelling process for candles? Uh, I mean, it's I, I guess I don't really I, I I don't really think about it. I smell something, and maybe that'll draw me over. Or like for instance, this one. I remember the moment that I was in the store and I walked over and I said, "Man." This candle has me written on it. And I opened it and I said, nope, it doesn't. But then I said, I need to stick it out because in life you don't give up. You're an all-in kind of guy. You're all in on the candle, right? Yeah. You go to the extreme. And that's what happened. Oh, man. And John has two children. Yes, he has had sex with a woman. Uh, Okay. (laughs) God, I just can't believe where... (laughs) 
every time though I'm always impressed every time no matter how much I try to like throw out a stumping question to see if you really know what you're talking about with candles you always have a legitimate answer I know candles man I get it like I I look like a guy that shouldn't be able to spell his own name even though it's only four letters but here here we are I get it I get it okay are you ready for our top five let's do it so our top five is top five winter sports movies What's your number five? I got to. It was hard for me to come up with non hockey, like winter sports. Man, I know hockey is like the main sport, but you would think there was a lot of other, you know, snowboarding, uh, curling, just just different sports uh, uh, movies. But really, most of them are centered around hockey. So, in saying that, uh, my number five is going to be Mystery Alaska. Wait a minute, was Russell Crowe in it? He was. Uh, he was. I, mean, I was trying to think of some other actors in it, but I can't. Um, I think it came out in 99, 98. Basically, it, it is what it sounds like. It's about a, about a local hometown team in Alaska that plays some pond hockey. In one way, shape, or form, they get an exhibition against, I think, the... Oh, God, people are going to kill me. Boston Bruins? Or the Philadelphia Flyers? I don't remember. but And they end up beating them, actually. So... Check it wow. out. It's a good movie. Mystery Alaska. My number five is Out Cold, which is a very underrated, not just a sports movie, not just a winter movie, but an underrated movie. If it, if, The only reason I put it so high up on the list is because it's not like super sports dedicated. There happens to be sports going on around it. But it's mainly a comedy with like Zach Galifianakis blah, 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 and somebody else, some other people. But it's actually legitimate. It's one of those movies that just came out at the wrong time. But it's a very underrated movie. I've actually seen it. And uh, anything with Zach Galifianakis, I detest. Except for uh, the Bachelor movie that escapes me. The Hangover? Yeah. But only the first one. Yeah, the rest are complete garbage. That one's almost complete garbage, but they pull it off. Yeah, Al Cold was a funny movie. It, yeah, it, it, it just hit at the wrong time. Like, for some reason, it's... And didn't become, like, a cult classic either. I wonder why. It should have been more popular. What's your number four? Uh, MVP, Most Valuable Primate. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if... Wait, now, is MVP, Most Valuable Primate, made by the same people who made Air Bud, Golden Retriever? Kidding. Golden it's Receiver? Not, it, it's not on my list. I just wanted to get oh. a laugh out of you. Uh, my number four is Miracle with Kurt Russell. Okay. That's about the U.S. beating Russia, right, in like 1980 or something like that. It is, and it's casted, if I remember right, pretty perfectly. I mean, they did a great job matching body types and faces to the actual players and coaches. I just don't care about it. <laughs> that's because you don't care about pride and nationalism and – us beating those Russians. It was just one of those things that was before my time. And I lived in Kansas where people didn't care about hockey. So it was never, like, it wasn't even, like, a later on. Same as Hoosiers. Everybody's like, Hoosiers is great. Never seen it. I have no interest in it. I don't watch any movies from before I was born. I mean, that's a shame. Because, what, what were you born? 64? 5? 85. <laughs> Wow, 85, really? Yeah. Okay. I thought we were way different in age, but I guess we're no. only two years apart. Uh, what's your number four? My number four. Oh, is it your turn or mine? No, what's your number four? Surf's Up. If you're not familiar with Surf's Up, it's about a penguin that goes on into a surfing contest. Animated movie. Wow. Uh, did you did you do any research for this list? or you? Just I did. And I look through all, movies ever. I look through. All, there's not really a lot of great winter sports movies, to be honest with you. I think it's heavily dominated up at the top. But I would put Surfs Up as my number four. It's about a penguin that goes and does a surfing contest. It's kind of a knockoff of all those other. It came out. It was like one of the last of the penguin movies. Remember, they did March of the Penguins. Then they did like Happy Feet. This was like, all right, what else can we do with a penguin? Oh my god. Just make him go surfing, I guess. 
Uh, all right, my number three is Slapshot. Okay, okay. My number three is also a hockey movie, Happy Gilmore. That is not a winter movie. He's a hockey player. But he's playing it in the in the summer. He's a hockey player. It's a hockey movie. It's a hockey player who happens to golf. No, no, that's completely wrong. Happy Gilmore is a winter sports movie. I think you're movie. gonna get some backlash for that comment. That's I fine. Do. That doesn't mean that, that that I'm wrong. Is Happy Gilmore a hockey player? He wants to be a hockey player. Yeah, but it's set in the summer, and it's a golf movie. It's a hockey movie to me. People are gonna say Die Hard's a Christmas movie. You can say Happy Gilmore is a hockey movie. No, because at least Die Hard is set in the winter. So. I, I is guess it Christmas we'll, time at Nakatomi Plaza? I guess we'll just disagree to agree on this one. I thought that was going to get you upset. I was like, I don't want to see his face when he hears No, I mean, I, I'm not going to. I mean, I, I think you're wrong. I think I think 95% of the population thinks you're wrong. That's fine. Facts are still facts, right? At one time, people thought the earth was flat. That doesn't mean that it is. All right, my number two, <laughs> Cool Runnings. Hmm. You like that other movie that much more then, huh? I think, number one, in, go ahead. I think overall, uh, if, if we're talking about the same number one and two, which we probably are, yeah. uh, Cool Runnings is a fantastic movie about a great story. Uh, but the lo the the long lastingness and the the reach of the other movies uh, are the reason why I put them as number one. Okay, so it sounds like we have basically the same one and two, but interchanged. So I have Mighty Ducks as number two, and Cool Runnings as number one. Yeah, and I have Cool Runnings as my number two, and then the I, I have the Mighty Duck franchise uh, as my number one. I would make an argument that the other Mighty Duck movies, not even like M2, right? Like once we got up into the threes and the eights or whatever, I would make an argument that the Mighty Ducks is brought down by the franchise. And if there was only one Mighty Duck movie, I would have put it ahead of Cool Runnings. But because they kept making them, it's now not as good of a winter sports movie as Cool Runnings. Yeah, I mean... Once again, I, I think if, if we're going singular movie, it's tough. I think Cool Runnings might be up there. But overall, Mighty Ducks are, are, are above Cool Runnings. Okay. Okay. I mean, I just disagree. But I, I think those are definitely one and two is Cool Runnings and Mighty Duck. What's uh, Mighty Ducks? What's in your honorable mention? And if you don't mention this movie, I'm going to be upset. Uh, so I, Tanya. I don't want serious sports movies. Oh, well, that's on my list. That's just me personally. Like, I just like that's one of those movies that I look at and like, I have no interest in thinking that much or pretending <laughs> to be so engrossed in this. I don't well, like any fancy movies, to be honest with you. Like, I don't like movies that were like, oh, I have to care about this now. I mean, listen, it happened in Detroit. At Joe Louis Arena. Here it's kind of a thing. It's kind of a thing in the area that, like, you know, it's one of those things that you're not proud of, but it's like, oh, hey, like, I mean, that's, it was a worldwide story and it stayed here for years. Uh, let me see. I have Blades of Glory because it's damn funny. Mm. Uh, I also have on here, and I don't expect you to uh, remember this movie, but Young Blood. Do you know what that is? Is it about Jack Youngblood? No. It's uh, Rob Lowe and Patrick Swayze playing hockey. Hmm. I wonder Rob what it is about winter sports that just makes it much harder to, like, envision an actor playing winter sports. Because there's maybe because there's a toughness that you have to have for winter sports that I don't necessarily collate with acting. Right, like I'm not like, oh shit, here oh. comes Rob Lowe. Watch out, he's gonna beat your ass. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, like, no. This was like peak Rob Lowe on coke, cocaine too. Like he could have been cocaine Rob instead of cocaine bear, cocaine Rob. 
I have most valuable primate. And I have, I can't believe you didn't put this, the Tooth Fairy with your boy. Yeah, no. no. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. No, not ever. I, I would, I'll put on his summer movie, Gridiron Gang, maybe in my honorable mention, but I'm not putting on the fucking Tooth Fairy, no. But that movie, for as much shit as we give him for doing that movie, look look at the doors that opened with him and Disney. Yeah, so that's why I'm surprised you didn't have it on there somewhere. That's a terrible movie. Yeah, it is a terrible movie. I mean, is it worse than Most Valuable Primate? Yes. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> Imagine that concept being like, what should we do? Let's have Dwayne The Rock Johnson be a hockey player, and he gets teeth, and we'll call him the Tooth Fairy. Like, that's... <laughs> If I was the executive in that room, I'd be like, look, you're fired. <laughs> you have to leave right now. Leave right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.